I call the member for Inda. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise uh, to speak on the Tax Laws Amendment Research and Development Bill 2010, and I do so sharing in great uh, disappointment and frustration, sharing in that frustration and disappointment with so many uh, industry leaders, so many businesses out there trying to do the right thing, trying to be innovative, trying to get out there ahead of the pack, and being frustrated by this government's very flawed and quite amateurish processes. And I say that because a debate like this should have been a positive one. It should have given us a chance to concentrate on sensible improvements and focus on an optimistic vision for the future of business R&D in Australia. But instead, uh, the nature of the government's approach to this issue has meant this will be a debate in which we will also be required to devote much of our attention to the misguided, arrogant and confrontational attitude of uh, the minister and um, the government that has followed in his lead, and to the range of mistakes, shortcomings and missed opportunities that have arisen as a result. As it campaigned for office in 2007, uh, Labor made a lot of gra grand uh, statements about R&D and many false assertions about the Howard government's record. And as part of this, it committed in its election policy to encouraging sustained growth in R&D activity and facilitating higher R&D intensity. But as has been the tale of so many fronts under the former uh, Labor Prime Minister and now the current one, Ms Gillard, this has proven to be hollow rhetoric. Far from growing and intensifying government support for R&D, the bill now before us, if passed, will actually do the opposite. And it's, uh, this is one of so many contradictions that have underpinned the government's actions over the last year. It's difficult to, to know, in fact, where to begin. Labor has proclaimed uh, its new R&D concession scheme will be more generous by saying it is increasing the rates of financial assistance to recipients. But what it has repeatedly and cynically failed to mention is that it is um, so drastically restricting eligibility criteria that far fewer businesses and far fewer activities will actually qualify for the assistance in the first instance. It's argued that its changes will be revenue neutral, but everyone out there in the real world knows fully well this is a revenue-raising measure. This is the same Labor Party that all but hyperventilated on the subject of costings during the election campaign, but as with the MBN hasn't and can't ever produce a single piece of modelling that proves its claims about the impact of its R&D tax changes. It's seized on figures that show marked improvements in business expenditure on R&D over recent years, but it hasn't made the obvious connection that this is happening under the current policy settings, settings it's attempting to radically change. It's talked about the importance of R&D to high-performing Australian companies, but has shifted the balance in this legislation so markedly that it actually punishes firms that secure successful R&D outcomes and gives greater rewards to those whose R&D activities end in failure. It stressed that its legislation will facilitate a more predictable and simple system, but it has instead sparked uncertainty because it's been unwilling and unable to explain how many of the as aspects of its proposed new regime will work. It surreptitiously inserted wording into the legislation that will cut off government support for R&D in the building industry, yet the man behind those words, Senator Carr, is the very same minister who frequently tours marginal electorates to wax lyrical about what he pretends is Labor's deep and abiding interest in the future of the building industry. It has said a key aim of these changes is to limit government spending on big claims by big companies for R&D. But meanwhile, just as in the last few months alone, it has reached into the top drawer, pulled out Senator Carr's checkbook and offered $20 million to the biopharmaceutical giant CSL and $22 million to the global IT powerhouse IBM for R&D without even blinking an eyelid at its double standards. It's asserted that it doesn't believe in the principle of giving government support to activities that companies would have been likely to pursue even without their assistance. But this is the very same party in the very same portfolio that has already allocated $90 million to a pro program called the Green Building Fund that operates 
almost entirely on that basis. And it's now to enlarge that program and embark on even more kind of spending, more of that kind of spending. It's repeatedly cited a report by KPMG to pretend its new legislation is, is world's best, but it hasn't even had the decency to confess that it misappropriated uh, the report or that KPMG immediately repudiated Labor's remarks and pointed out the near opposite to be true. Indeed, such is Mr Carr's audacity and desperation on this issue that he cites KPMG as a highly respected and credible authority on occasions when he thinks it will suit him to wrongly quote from this report, and he draws in, in a number of his colleagues in perpetuating these myths about the report as well. Yet at other times, he subjects KPMG and other professional businesses to withering criticism for daring for daring to be among a very large number of expert advisory firms that oppose this bill. This is a government that has made a big play of supposedly compromising on its regressive mining tax, but now presents to the parliament another piece of legislation that will whack the mining industry straight between the eyes. It's professed to be interested in manufacturing and said it doesn't want to govern a country that doesn't make things. But this bill will punish manufacturers at exactly the same time as they're being pounded by rising interest rates, a high dollar and the loss of more than 73,000 jobs over the last three years. Just contemplate even for a moment how draconian and how destructive a piece of Labor legislation must be for even the AMWU to be moved to tell, in no uncertain terms, uh, tell um, the Labor Party to go back to the drawing board. It's also pontificated about how consultative it's been towards R&D stakeholders, but in reality we know it's been the exact opposite, and it's even barely feigned an interest in the constructive criticism and opinions of others. At the two key times at which it's sought feedback on its plans were over the Christmas and Easter holidays when most affected businesses weren't even open. The minister himself has spent much of the past year lashing out at people who have dared to suggest changes to his proposals. He's prepared to publicly la label people um, of goodwill as, quote, well-organised campaigners with vested interests and losers who squeal like stuck pigs. And I'd really hate to think of what he... Uh, how he describes um, some of his enemies behind closed doors or, in fact, some of his um, factional opponents. Possibly worst of all in this process, Mr Carr has set up a full review of innovation policy um, in Australia, and he did that when he first became minister. He appointed Terry Cutler to head the review. And whenever challenged during his first year or more as minister, he gave a stock standard answer that every conceivable problem known to man could have been solved um, or would be solved by the Cutler Review. And this was uh, as true of R&D policy as of most other issues in his portfolio. But as we all know, uh, those of us with a genuine interest in innovation, it turned out that Senator Carr uh, immediately um, turned his back on that review. And like his leader and his front bench colleagues, he's shown a complete distaste, disinterest for necessary sensible reform. So much so, in the same spirit as uh, the likes of John Mendoza and Ross Garno before him, Dr Cutler has now been moved to publicly voice a series of concerns and criticism, uh, criticisms of this uh, rudderless government and to express his acutely felt disappointment at the way in which his advice has been disregarded. But we on this side of the House are not surprised. On R&D policy in particular, Dr Cutler's criticisms are damning. He stated that Senator Carr has taken what was a good idea and, I quote, strangled it with even more red tape and a hostile narrowing of eligibility criteria. And then, just to top it all off, Labor seeks somehow to blame the coalition for the incompetence and the ad hoc nature that has characterised the government's entire carriage of this issue. Among Mr Carr's repeated slurs, one of the best was his attempt to convince the media that the coalition had supposedly filibustered um, on this legislation in the Senate back in June. The reality is, for anyone who's followed this debate, there could hardly be any filibustering of the legislation because it wasn't even um, in the chamber for debate. He's also fond of saying that the coalition wants to oppose this legislation sight unseen. 
Quite apart from the fact that the argument is completely wrong, let it be remembered that this is the same minister um, who, when he hasn't been insulting them, has consistently turned a blind eye to the views of those who've had any constructive criticism to make. If the implications weren't so serious, then all of these problems and contradictions would be comical. But they're actually frightening because the government not only fails to acknowledge any of them, but shows no interest in rectifying them. When challenged, it only digs its heels in further and aggressively blames anyone but itself for a mess that is entirely of its own making. Sadly, what is really at the heart of this matter is a willful misunderstanding by Labor of the crucial importance of business R&D. And far from bringing the kind of substance to an important debate that should be expected, should be expected of a national government. It's tried to silence and intimidate people with a different point of view. And I am disappointed. I would expect something more from a minister who has spent 17 year, the last 17 years as a senator in the Australian parliament and has reached the ripe age of 55. You would expect greater wisdom and a greater willingness to act in the interests of Australians, future Australian business, and particularly manufacturing. But all we've seen is a lack of direction, vision and leadership. That, Mr. Speak, Madam, Speak, Madam Deputy Speaker, is why the Coalition will move a second reading amendment to this bill, a point to which I'll return to uh, very soon. We don't have a problem with changes such as the proposed shift from concessions to credits or the relaxation of foreign ownership rules in relation to IP or the idea of encouraging more blue sky exploratory research or giving increased support to SMEs. Each of those object objectives is perfectly reasonable and the coalition has never had an issue with them despite the government's serial attempts to misrepresent our position and assert otherwise. Naturally, it's uh, also absolutely fundamental to ensure value for money for the taxpayer. But this legislation goes way beyond all of that. Among its many ill-conceived effects, um, it's going to restrict the range of activities that qualify for support, including by introducing regressive new definitions of core and supporting R&D, alter the eligibility criteria so that supporting R&D will only be funded if it satisfies a confusing and very complex dominant purpose test, increase the barriers for assistance under new feedstock provisions, make the role of innovation Australia and Oz industry more discretionary and less accountable, lift the compliance and administrative complexities for firms because of the increased um, oneness of, um, on them, on, uh, the, the increased um, onerous provisions on them to prove their eligibility and uh, reduce support for spillover and additionality benefits. And all of this comes before we even get to the issue of the government's extraordinary decision to make this legislation retrospective. And quite simply, <laughs> that is an absolutely ludicrous proposal and something that plainly defies common sense. We're talking about taxation arrangements here, and I don't know if the Labor Party is aware of this, I'm guessing not, but no government should ever take a decision to backdate amendments uh, to tax law uh, lightly. In fact, whether they ever should is quite a serious question of um, fair and accountable and just government. Of course, uh, anyone who has closely followed this debate knows that Labor's use of this threat of retrospectivity was primarily a, a political tool, a, an ambit claim, if you like. By putting this spectre in play and then indicating behind closed doors they were prepared to give some ground on it, they were able to make it uh, look to observers as if they were somehow making some generous concession. And this tactic has also helped them to shift focus away from many of the uh, other retrograde elements of the bill.